السريري للشمال ونجبره على الاندفاع نحو الشرق والاندفاع نحو الغرب في محاولة تشبه الخيال وإذا تحقق لقاء النهرين نكون قد أسسنا شبكة ري ضخمة ليس لها مثيل في العالم Fifty degrees centigrade above zero. We are in the desert in northeastern Libya. A convoy of trucks is loaded with large concrete pipes. Pipes to be used in the construction of what Muammar al-Gaddafi hopes will be the eighth wonder of the world. Libya's eccentric head of state, the man the Western media loved to hate, the clown terrorist and suspected mastermind behind Lockerbie, is today forging a new image for himself as a modern-day Moses and self-proclaimed Lord Protector of the Waters, as a man of peace leading his North African desert state into the 21st century. In the name of Allah, Gaddafi blesses his pipes, the new prophet carrying out the commands of God. Two, one, zero. And God has commanded that the desert be ripped up by an army of bulldozers and dynamite. In 1984, construction work began on the largest irrigation system the world has ever seen. Costing more than $35 billion, the project is an ambitious feat of engineering technology, a lasting monument to Gaddafi's reign in Saharan Africa. But it is also one of the most controversial construction projects in the world today, a cause of concern for both the West and Libya's neighbors. A dream of hope for his admirers, a potential nightmare for his enemies, the Great River has become a concrete incarnation of one of the most intriguing political figures of our times. We were allowed to follow his 8,000 kilometer dream and separate the facts from the myths behind Libya's miracle under the sand. This miracle consists of two pipelines pumping water from the Sahara to the north. Tripoli, Libya's ancient capital. There is only one God, and his name is Allah. The eternal call of Islam welcomes us to the socialist people's Jamahiriya, the official name of Libya. Bashir, our devout Muslim guide assigned to us by the authorities, observes the custom of ritual washing in the oldest mosque in Tripoli. A trusted member of the leader's inner clique, Bashir was to remain constantly by our side for the next eight weeks. It was up to him what we could film and whom we could interview, but he refused to be interviewed himself. For 15 years, Libyans have been outcasts of the international community, shunned as terrorists and fanatical warriors of Islam. All the Libyans we met were eager to shed that image. One of the first people we interviewed was Yusuf, the muezzin of the mosque, who has lived all his life in the old city.
He is a weaver by profession, proud not only of his craft, but also of the achievements of the revolution, the great river, and his beloved leader. I love the masses as I love my own father, yet fear them in the same way, writes Gaddafi the poet. But do the masses love or fear their adopted son? Today, Gaddafi's state of the masses is in crisis. Economic sanctions have fueled discontent in the cities and in the army. For the first time, there is talk of organized opposition. To win back popularity, Gaddafi has launched a new charm offensive, using the most powerful personality cult in the Arab world today. And a driving force behind that cult has become fresh water, a priceless resource throughout North Africa. In 1996, select districts of Tripoli began to receive water from the leader's desert pipeline, his gift to a thirsty people. Today, this water is a luxury supplied to those with political connections in the revolutionary committees. Noria, a housewife in the old town, is one of the lucky ones. Her loyalty has been rewarded. Even the less fortunate, such as these copper makers who still rely on rainwater, have been told that a golden age is just around the corner. But they are still optimistic, or at least under Bashir's watchful eye. <laughs> Yet the West remains deeply suspicious about this mysterious tunnel under the sand. It finds Gaddafi's new image as a man of miracles hard to swallow. The Libyans we were allowed to talk to tried to allay such fears. ويتهموا فينا أن هذه عبارة عن معابر يعني أو مخازن للأسلحة أو يعني في أثناء الحرب يستغلوها فم كمخابئ ولكن هذا كلام باطل وما ليش أي أساس من الصحة. Last year, German newspapers claimed that the Great River carried anything but water, and that so far not a drop had flowed into Tripoli. Yet endless supplies of water are visible everywhere in the city center. Libyans and foreign observers alike told us that when the city was first connected to the Great River, the old pipes burst under the strain, and the center looked like the after effects of an airstrike. Tahuna, 100 kilometers from the capital, the most notorious section of the Great River. It was here that Western critics became convinced that something more sinister than water lies down these shafts. In the early 1990s, Western experts accused the Libyans of using water for an underground chemical weapons plant they believed Gaddafi had built here. The Pentagon even considered military action. To counter such claims, the Libyans altered the course of the pipeline. Whether water is flowing through here or not, the authorities assure us that foreign observers can inspect the site at any time. Libya has nothing to hide. Well, what's going on? There's nothing behind that. I mean, what, you know, the, those terrorism countries, I mean, they say this is something behind this project, something hides in the, in the, the Bible, which is not, I think it's, nobody can say. Nobody can answer this question because this need no answer. It is a 
big project, thousands of people work on it. Many people from England, maybe from America, they work on this project. An avenue of pipes stretching as far as the eye can see. The foundations of Brother Colonel Mwamwa's high-tech pyramids in the North African desert. Libya's engineer-in-chief keeps his miracle under very close control. Bregaplan, the factory producing the pipes that have come to symbolize the ambitious dimensions of the great man-made river. <laughs> 6 30 a.m. Workers are on their way to the factory. Defiantly anti-American, Gaddafi once described his country as a Pepsi-Cola bottle being shaken by foreigners until it is about to burst. Ironically, this outspoken crusader against Western imperialism hired an Anglo-American firm, Brown and Root, to design the entire project. The chief engineer ridiculed the idea that pipes designed by Americans could be used as weapons against Americans. كيف ما نحن نعلم ان ان في الات كثيره جدا هنا في المصنع كانت مصنعه في الولايات المتحده الامريكيه وجم وتم استيرادها من الولايات المتحده الامريكيه وتركيبها تم تركيبها هنا بواسطه المقاول السابق اللي هو دونجا فكيف مش عارف انا يعني كيف يقولوها الكلام مضايا ان نحن هم صنعوا الالات وعارفين ان هنا الالات هذينا شنو 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 الوظائف بتاعها الالات هذينا فكيف تو يتهمونا بان نحن قاعدين نصنعوا في اسلحه او غير اسلحه whether or not these pipes are being used for military purposes, only one man really knows. But in Libya today, economic self-sufficiency seems to be a more urgent goal than yet another showdown with the White House. The Lord Protector of the Waters certainly appears to be on a race against time. Over half a million pipes have already come off the assembly lines and now lie under the desert sand. In fact, Libya has become the largest pipe producer in the world. It's tea time. Ruben comes from the Philippines. He's been working in Brega Plant since 1994. He only has a chance to see his family once a year. As we have been saying, there's no place like home. But, you know, if we are thinking of the welfare of our family, uh, we can find a job in the Philippines, but, you know, the salary is not quite high. Uh, uh, I mean, comparing with the salary what we receive here. Everything about the Great River is enormous in scale. These pipes are produced using concrete specially reinforced with iron wire. They are built to last 50 years and are supposedly bomb-proof. These pipes reflect in concrete and steel the suspicious crush or be crushed philosophy of their Bedouin creator, a man who bases his ideology on Nietzsche and the Quran. We set out for the south. Here in Al Kufra, we look for the source of the Mammoth Project. It is hard for us to imagine that Gaddafi's freshwater oceans lie underneath this bone dry desert. In Al Kufra, Life pulsates 1,000 kilometers from the coast. This is Libya's El Dorado, a desert boom town totally dependent on underground water for its existence. It is also Libya's gateway to black Africa. Many immigrant workers have come to this seedy settlement in search of new opportunities. Indeed, repeated influxes of foreign workers have made life less regimented here than in other parts of Libya. 
That night, we were invited to a wedding to see the good times brought by the great river. The Quran allows a man up to four wives. In Libya, most men settle for one. Monogamy rather than polygamy is the rule in Gaddafi's brand of socialist Islam. The climax of the wedding is a song of praise, not to the happy couple, but curiously enough, to that miracle river gushing below them. The great river will give us new life, it will give us crops, they sing, echoing an ancient dream which has lost none of its force today. For it was in southeast Libya, in the 1950s, that foreign oil companies first stumbled upon vast oceans of water. These deposits have been trapped underground for thousands of years, since the time the Sahara enjoyed rainy seasons and lush green forests, and North Africa was the breadbasket of the ancient world. Today, the water sustains the largest agricultural project in the Sahara. Al-Kufra is Gaddafi's strongest weapon against his critics, proof that his dream of a green Libya is more than an empty slogan. A hundred giant circles are watered by rotating sprinklers, which have spun unceasingly for the last 30 years. A mundane process performed every day, but one with hidden dangers. In the summer months, only 30% of the water makes it to the ground. The rest evaporates, while the salt from the water remains, slowly eating away at the newly fertile soil. The director of the project told us that the leader is turning back the geological clock and restoring the Sahara to its former glory. Gaddafi is preaching the politics of paradise, promising a new Garden of Eden that will one day create an economic power strong enough to challenge the developed world, the Islamic state of the wretched. Al-Kufra is the breadbasket of the country, producing enough grain to feed the entire population. Most of the agricultural labourers come from Chad and Sudan. But Al-Kufra is located in a remote spot, far from major trade routes. Transport costs are thus high, and the entire project can only be sustained by enormous state subsidies. Despite this, Gaddafi sees money as no object. In his relentless drive to make Libya self-sufficient, he wants to get even more water from Al-Kufra. Local experts, on the other hand, fear billions of petrodollars are being wasted on extravagant projects. They think it would be much cheaper to feed the population with imported food. But Gaddafi refuses to give up on his dream of a more fertile Mother Earth. Over the years, the colonel has turned this desert boomtown almost into a military camp. His revolutionary guards have uprooted thousands of desert nomads and brought them here to join his army of the wretched. But murmurings of discontent can be heard among the rank and file. Uh, الكفرة الاستطاني ونحول لكم فيه مزارع المزرعة بدل المزرعة والحوش بدل الحوش وتقربوا المدن جينا هنا وبدنا فيه نوع من الخدمات ولكن بدنا تلاجن تدريجيا حتى الآن لا يوجد شيء لبار ينهارا الحشاش زحفات المساكن كما ترى Officially, the broken promises in Al-Kufra are a result of the UN embargo. In reality, such sacrifices are necessary to pay for the rising cost of pumping water 1,000 kilometers to the north. Five million Libyans living on the coast can't be moved south at the click of a finger. So the water must be pumped north. Benghazi, 
Libya's second largest city, has been supplied with water from the Great River since 1991. Water from the south suddenly appears from out of the desert sand, ready to be pumped into the Omar Mokhtar Reservoir, one of four giant artificial lakes in the north. The headquarters of the entire project located in Benghazi. The leader stares at us blankly from a computer screen. The Great River is now online as the Libyans spread the green message through the web. If only water is flowing under the desert, is it being used solely for humanitarian purposes? We asked the deputy manager. This water will, uh, will, will, will serve everybody, will serve the farmer himself. He will, he will start construct his farm by himself. He will work hard for his, uh, for his land. Before they have no water, now they will have water. Uh, this is a new life for them. The Great Mamed River is a new life for everybody, for the, those farmers who are living in the coastal areas, in a farmers which had no, they haven't watered before. To see the new life promised to ordinary Libyans, we travel along the coast. We have come to visit the model farms that have been built here in recent years. The leader's smiling face appears on posters everywhere, promising Libyans that they will enter a green paradise in the near future. Not long ago, Ashek was a shepherd, but he jumped at the chance to make a new beginning on one of those model farms. All Ashek's needs are taken care of by his local agricultural cooperative. And one day, we are told, the whole country will be covered with these water tanks a concrete invasion designed and built entirely by Western firms. For Gaddafi lacks the technical know-how to create his green Libya, nor can he turn a nation of nomads into modern farmers overnight. So he is having to look abroad for the million workers he needs. One of the success stories of the cooperative is Ahmed Altrat, he has benefited from his working experiences in America. Most of my time is spent in Texas, in Fort Worth. There, the climate is just about the same. I concentrate all about the fruit, so as such grapes, figs, bamboo grounds. I hope that they remain thousand, thousand years. The native population fears what this foreign deluge will bring. For shepherds like Abdallah, the biggest losers of the Green Revolution will be ordinary Libyans and their traditional way of life. What about the water? The 
The revolution is facing a new dilemma. To appease the wretched, Gaddafi must give them water. But to do so, he must rely on the same Western companies he threw out when he first came into power. If the people feel they are being driven off their own land, stormy seas may lie ahead for the Lord Protector of the Waters. Only a few kilometers further on, a new pipeline is being built for a new reservoir. al -Katra. This is the showpiece of the whole project. One kilometer wide, it is designed to contain 24 million cubic meters of water. At one stage, supply problems led to the project being suspended. But today, work is once more in progress. Money is again flowing into the state coffers, and many foreign companies are eager to profit from Libya's new prosperity. Modesty has never been one of Gaddafi's weaknesses. Here in Al-Qatra, he is hoping to emulate the great builders of the ancient world. Ajdabia, the first town to receive water from the Great River back in 1990. So many years in the international wilderness have made Westerners a rare sight in Libya. We were an object of curiosity wherever we went. The members of the local People's Congress spent hours telling us about the achievements of the revolution. But the best lesson in revolutionary principles came from an unlikely source. Gaddafi's personal Iron Maiden in Ashdabia. Libya is one of few countries in the Islamic world where women are not only seen, but also heard. The Dark Lady herself told us that the leader is a great liberator who has freed women from the tyranny of their backward fathers. <laughs> Just outside the town is a large holding reservoir, the jewel in Ajdabia's crown. Our hosts insist we see it before we leave. Here, as everywhere, all papers must be in order before we are allowed in. In two years, when the reservoir can be used to its full capacity, two million cubic meters of water daily will flow to Sirt and Benghazi. But for some reason, the reservoir wasn't running to its full capacity. Only one of the two inlets was pumping water. No one told us why. The inauguration of the Eastern Branch back in 1991. Gaddafi's message to the world that night was clear. Those Western leaders who don't believe in Libya's miracle will have their heads shoved firmly into the sand dug up for the Great River. And yet, nine years later, that miracle river is still not fully operational. Unexplained gaps still remain. Can military or humanitarian motives alone explain why millions of petrodollars are being spent on a still imperfect system? Or is Brother Mwamwa being driven by a higher goal? We look for answers to these questions in the vast Syria well fields in the south. All 200 wells in the region are checked and controlled 24 hours a day. 
At first, we come across the same message we have heard everywhere on our journey. The Great Nile River project is known to the Libyans, and it is very offensive to every single Libyan to say, you know, if you want to insult a Libyan, you talk about the man-made river project. They think it's the greatest thing ever happened. It's the eighth miracle they consider it. So when you talk about the Great Man River project, it's a humanitarian project. It's for the people, it's water, it's for the best of everybody. Rising above the desert, close to the control center, are two giant header tanks. These majestic cathedrals of water are vital to the entire eastern branch. When there's too much pressure in the pipeline, excess water is fed into them. But one of these enormous hulks is strangely empty. Not a drop of water to be seen, just like the water inlet in Ashdabia. The authorities are obviously not telling us the whole truth. The engineer in chief has promised Libyans generations of prosperity and a supply of water lasting thousands of years. For two decades, they have been led to expect nothing less than the eighth wonder of the modern world. But clearly, something is wrong. There are signs that water was here once, but not water fit for human use. Our friend in the control room told us that this tank would be filled when the Tasurbo well fields are in operation. Something else had been on our minds since leaving Brega plant. Why is Gaddafi on such a race against time? On the east and on the west side, you have Algeria and Egypt. Do they also have these, these water reservoirs under the desert? Uh, I'm not a geological, but currently they have a problem. You know, North Africa is considered the worst, uh, except Egypt with the Nile, but. Uh, the whole coastal North African countries have a, a problem. The environment of Saharan Africa is one of the most fragile on Earth. Water is becoming a dwindling resource. And it may well become the new dividing line between the haves and the have-nots. We can see that there might be some quarrel, some struggle, even some wars about having and getting water. You as a country in Africa, you are not afraid that you will get into troubles with your neighboring countries? That's for the uh, future to tell. To allay the fears of his neighbors, Gaddafi is planning artificial rivers for them as well. These could throw a lifeline to poor countries like Chad and Sudan, but also make them increasingly dependent on their benefactor. Slowly, the mystery behind Gaddafi's dream is opening up before us. We want to find out more in the Tasurbo well fields to the south. Within two hours, our own future seemed far more uncertain. Rick, our sound engineer, is seriously injured when one of our vans crashes. Only thanks to a hastily arranged airlift were we able to get him to hospital. Doctors later told us that if the plane had been delayed by a few hours, Rick would have died. Help, however, had come from an unexpected quarter, from Gaddafi himself, our elusive guardian angel. Praise the man who gives us life. This poster greets us on our entry into Tasibo, a small rundown town in the middle of nowhere. One street, 
one petrol station. These are the people the West never sees but greatly fears, the shock troops of the Holy Jihad. It's market day. Farmers from the local Zuwaya tribe trade in the same goods their fathers and grandfathers did. They are also the same Libyans who have been told that prosperity waits for them 600 meters below ground. But this is the water that suddenly stopped flowing into that header tank a few years ago. Nuri from the Great River Authority, wanted to show us that there was nothing wrong with Tasurbo's water. There were just a few technical hitches that had to be overcome. He said the water was perfectly fit for human and agricultural use. And yet, local farmers still don't have access to the artesian wells. Mahmoud, one of the most respected elders of the community still uses the old obsolete pumps. He still has to get his water the hard way, by hand. Ecologists are warning that drilling in the area is causing underground water levels to sink 40 centimeters each year, bringing more and more salt to the surface and slowly destroying the soil. But Mahmoud has been told a different story. He invited us to his home to have a look at his rural idyll. Gaddafi once wrote that the city is the hell he escapes to. Here we had the chance to see the heaven he mythologizes. We hear from Mahmoud that all the things people say about Libya are lies. Libyans don't throw bombs at America. Libya is strong. It has survived the embargo because it has water and lots of it. The great river, he tells us, is Libya's greatest treasure, helping to feed the mouths of five million people and in the future maybe neighboring countries as well. Water is like a hallucinogenic drug, affecting both those at the top and ordinary people like Mahmoud. It is also a powerful source of national identity. We went digging for Libya's buried treasure, the foundations of its identity. And we found watery mud. Blessed are the wretched, how beautiful will be their dawn, and how sweet and great will be their victory. The prophet colonel launches his desert crusade, and these wells are his new mosques. Mahmoud the farmer is also Mahmoud the prospector, drilling for Libya's liquid gold. But he and his co-workers are digging deeper and deeper for that priceless water, which is not getting to Syria or going anywhere. Romeo Farcasano is a Romanian geologist. His job is to carry out tests on rock samples taken from different soil layers below the water level. The success of Gaddafi's crusade depends on exactly how much water lies below the Sahara, and more importantly, how long it will last. If 
this is a fossil water, in time it might be exhausted. At least 30 years it might be this water. If this water has some alimentation area from the border of, uh, I don't know, uh, of the African continent, that means this water cannot be exhausted because we have rain, we have uh, re-alimentation, and the water will be renewed. And therefore, we'll have water enough for a very long time, a very, very long time. All the countries of drought-ridden Saharan and sub-Saharan Africa have a vast source of fresh water right on their doorsteps. But so far, only one man has the technology to get it. From Lord Protector of the Waters to Lord Protector of all Islamic Africa. Basima, a forbidden oasis. This was the only place we came to alone, without the knowledge of our full-time escorts. Instead of a thriving oasis, we found a ghost town at the very source of the well fields. Twenty years ago, the owners of these huts were resettled during the regime's offensive against the Bedouins who opposed its modernization programs. We came here to discover more about the quality of the water, but the only person we found was Robinson, a goat breeder from Sudan. He doesn't care about politics, but he's still happy. He has enough to drink. Only one meter? What about the lake behind you? But what victory awaits Gaddafi's wretched in the future? Perhaps the answer lies in that lake. We go there to see the effects of the drilling. And we found the reason why no water was going north. Salt, a white poison spreading across the desert. Ignoring the warning signs around them, the Libyans will soon use filters and increase drilling fivefold. While this will make the water cleaner, it will also unleash the demons of the Sahara itself. To assure victory for his wretched, Gaddafi must gamble with the forces of nature. But his stakes are high, perhaps too high. in the western branch of the great river. Here the water is purer. Gaddafi knows it and has concentrated all his resources on finishing the pipeline in two years. Many South Koreans are working on the western pipeline. They have come to Libya to avoid military service in their own country. Now they are foot soldiers in a new campaign. And many of them seem to have swallowed the same drug as their Libyan co-workers. This is a desert. We have to be changed from desert to green. Grew trees after 10 years. All Africa peoples supply this water and some lice. Mr. Kim may think the Great River is a wonderful gift to Africa,
but it's a surprise present kept well hidden from the prying eyes of the outside world. And no more so than here, 400 kilometers from the coast, where our cameras were especially unwelcome. Near the Ashwa Reef settlement, a water tank is already finished, a personal reward from Gaddafi to the local Bedouin nomads for their political loyalty. This harmless looking tank receives 3,000 cubic meters of water every day. An anonymous source told us that only a tiny fraction of that water is being pumped into Ashwa Reef to meet the town's modest needs. The rest is being channeled in the opposite direction, deep into the wilderness of the desert. Many in the west will look over that horizon and see not a pipeline to paradise, but a time bomb waiting to explode. By doing so, they may be overlooking a more powerful weapon, a new bargaining chip in the hands of an unpredictable gambler. In Libya, continuing shortages and waste are increasing concerns about the whole sense of the project. But in this nomad police state, open criticism remains unthinkable. When tending to his sheep, the police chief in Ashwarif loves nothing more than defending the great river. It's morning in Ashwarif. This young man has the one key controlling the entire water supply for the local people. If he doesn't wake up, they'll go thirsty. Libya's angel of mercy may soon be holding a much larger key, turning the region's liquid reserves on and off at will. By playing politics with water, Gaddafi is not only threatening the environment of the Sahara, but may also be sowing the seeds of conflict for future generations. We are from the clan of Moses, the people of Ashwarif proudly tell us. A special Bedouin celebration takes place that night. The police chief tries to create order out of chaos among the chosen people. After the celebration, we talk to the elders of the clan. Great leader, we will follow you wherever you go, these old men sing, worshippers of the cult of the colonel. The Lord Protector has staked his political future on the success of a concrete fantasy. The risks are great, but the prize could be infinitely greater. For as the 21st century dawns, the key to power in North Africa will be neither another Lockerbie nor a chemical weapons plant. It may be just a few drops of water.